Welcome to today's eLotus webinar, your leading source for acupuncture continuing education. I'm Donna Chow, your host. This course, titled Fundamentals of Acupuncture Points, Integrating Dong's Acupuncture and TCM Principles, Part 1, is sponsored by Evergreen Herbs and presented by Dr. Henry McKay. We will be hosting Part 2 tomorrow, so we hope that you guys can all join us for that as well. Today's webinar will run from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. and we'll have four breaks, two in the morning and two in the afternoon, and lunch will be from 12 to 1 p.m. Well, before we start, let's go ahead and ensure an interactive session by setting your chat preference to everyone. For our instructor questions, please type your questions into the Q&A box. Our speaker, Dr. Henry McCann, is the author of Pricking the Vessels, Bloodletting Therapy in Chinese Medicine and co-author of Practical Atlas of Jung's Acupuncture. Dr. McCann has been teaching Master Dong courses with eLotus since 2015. So to discover more of his courses, visit his instructor page at eLotus.org. Let's now welcome Dr. Henry McCann and dive into today's session. Okay, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm really uh, pleased to uh, to be here and to present this topic. Um, so just a, a bit about the kind of material we're gonna cover today and, and why this topic. Um, so I've been, uh, as Donna said in that introduction, I've been, I've been doing courses uh, for eLotus now for what would be like eight years, I guess, at this point. Uh, and uh, I've been teaching continuing education courses for uh, longer than that. And then I've also taught uh, in the United States at the master's degree level for, for acupuncture Chinese medicine students for well over 20 years now. And a couple of things that uh, come up are things that I'm hoping to try to address uh, today and tomorrow as we go through the material. So one of the things that I think that we can that we see or that I've seen over time Oh, hold on, we're not advancing. There we go. Um, so one of the things that I've seen over time, which uh, which 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 is we'll talk about the problem first. Like what's the issue we're going to tr going to try to address? And then hopefully I'll be giving some of my suggestions for a, a solution to a way that we can sort of work around this problem and start thinking of acupuncture in a way that I think is, more interesting, more clinically relevant, a bit fresher. It will keep us engaged and interested. You know, I uh, Donna and I had uh, dinner last night, and I said to her, and this is absolutely the truth. There's not a day that goes by where I where I wake up. I mean, some days I'd rather not wake up as early as I can, especially when we all have that ADM patient who makes the appointment and doesn't show. Right, <laughs> that's, that's like the worst thing ever. But there's not a day that goes by where I don't want to be in my clinic when it, when I go into the clinic, right? Because I find it engaging, I find it rewarding, and it's it's you know I've been in practice. This is this is a, about 25 years for me, uh, going on 25 years now, um, and I'm looking forward to the next 25 years of, of of being in the clinic. And part of that is because I find the material very engaging, and I find the material something that I keep on chewing on over and over again in a way to better understand it in a deep in a on a deeper level that makes it more relevant to patients as well. Right. So that's what I'm going to hopefully try to model as we go through the material here. And I also find acupuncture really, really engaging, just as much so as herbal medicine practice. Right. So I think most of us have the experience in in Chinese medicine school. Uh, and again, it's not going to be everyone's experience, but I think a lot of us have the experience, but because of the nature of studying herbal medicine, herbal medicine usually requires a lot more time and energy and acupuncture seems to be easier for us to sort of wrap our head around, at least on that, at that beginning level. Um, and acupuncture can be really very engaging and uh, very intricate if we start opening our eyes and looking at uh, at ways that we can sort of really evaluate things. So I wanted to go back to the basics. So a lot of the courses that we've taught here in the past for eLotus and the classes that I teach all over the world really deal more with things like, you know, Dong's acupuncture for pain management or Dong's acupuncture for, you know, GYN or Dong's acupuncture for endocrine or for stress and emotional problem, whatever it happens to be. And what, what we see is that we start learning protocols that are effective. I'm not saying that these aren't effective things to learn, 
But sometimes with some people learning the material, what we're missing is that really fundamental way of looking at acupuncture at its really sort of base and core level. And when we can do that, then I think the protocols make much more sense and they cease becoming protocols, but rather models that we can then base our own treatments on going forward. So we don't have to memorize a protocol when we understand the protocol, then we can utilize it effectively or change it sometimes in small ways, sometimes in big ways that makes it more relevant for our patients in the clinic. So this class I've actually really been excited about and I've been prepping a long time. Uh, as you can see here, I have probably about 150 pages of lecture notes for myself to go through. And I will say that today, I don't think we're gonna get through the entire PowerPoint. And as I was, as, because we have 300 plus slides. So I, when I told my wife I had 300 slides, she rolled her eyes several times as she is wont to do often when I say things. Um, but I thought to myself, should I cut some of it out or should I just leave it in? And my final decision was I'm just going to leave it in so that even if we don't get through all of the material that I want to ideally should be, should, we should be able to get through to get together. We, I'm not, I know we're not going to do it today. At least you have the PowerPoint, you have the handouts to go back and be able to, once we get the idea of how we're evaluating things, if you have the outline in terms of the handout, you can go in and fill in the blanks for the blanks that we don't have the time to fill in today, right? Because I think this is a really very uh, useful exercise. So today and then tomorrow, what we're going to be doing is going through how do we look at not dong acupuncture points, but how can we go back to the tradition? Most of us here, I'm assuming, learned, and I'll call it conventional TCM acupuncture points from the beginning. And when I say conventional TCM acupuncture points, I want to just clarify that I'm including in that Japanese acupuncture traditions, Korean acupuncture traditions, other acupuncture traditions that are all based on the same seed that comes from early China, where we have 12 channels, the Du and the Ren, and the points on those channels, with some variations, and that's okay. So when I say TCM acupuncture, I'm not necessarily meaning TCM is a modern systems approach to Chinese medicine, but rather just Chinese medicine as the sort of core tradition in its various and many expressions that have happened for a long period of time, as opposed to something like Dong's acupuncture, which we know has different point locations, different names, sometimes different usages, even though they overlap. So rather than starting from Dong's acupuncture, where people may not be familiar with the points, my idea was to go back and really start looking at the points we all studied at one point in time and really go back and reevaluate them. So that comes to the first question, why? Why should we go back and reevaluate them? And part of it comes up in response to a question that I've seen or a problem that I've seen when teaching master's students, doctoral students, and then continuing education for a long time now. And what I've seen oftentimes happens, which is the problem I'm trying to rectify, is that acupuncture education oftentimes focuses on the memorization of point actions. And let me clarify what I mean about point actions. So for example, when we are looking at acupuncture points, these are two examples that I like to give because I think most of us can resonate with these examples in our own education. For example, spleen nine, everyone memorizes drains, memorizes drains damp, right? And if anyone out there in acupuncture land looking, listening today or listening sometime in the future, speaking from the past then, if you have not taken your national board exams, you haven't taken your California exam yet or whatever, when someone says spleen nine, you say drains damp. That's the, that's the basic answer you need for the examination. And that's fine. Or when someone says kidney two, we all have to memorize, okay, it clears vacuity heat. That's the basic, that's the basic thing. Now, that is not necessarily a bad thing. But when we go back and even look, and so some just as a preface, some of the books that I'm going to be referencing over and over again through this, through this lecture today and then tomorrow. First, of course, we're taking a lot of our points 
the the sort of the the actions and indications from books like uh, uh, Deadman and and uh, Peter Deadman and and Mazin Alkafaji's wonderful book A Manual of Acupuncture. Another book that I'm going to be referencing over and over again is Explanation of the Channels and Points by Yue Hanjun. This is a Qing Dynasty text that was translated really wonderfully uh, by uh, Purple Cloud Press. In my opinion, and I wrote the preface to the second volume, so it's I'm really passionate about these books. I think they're some of the best books in English available for really sort of delving into the heart of acupuncture points. And those are in the the bibliography in the in the uh, in the PowerPoint, so you can find the the information on that. But we're going to go taking information from these books and really going back and drilling down on it. So it's not that it's a problem that we memorize spleen nine drains dampness, but I think a lot of us forget that at least in Deadman, you can see it also regulates the spleen, resolves dampness, opens moves the water passageways, and benefits lower. So there are more than one specific action. And kidney two also has a number of specific actions. Now, fundamentally, what is the difference then between actions and indications? Because what I'm going to do today is focus down on indications so we can understand where these things called actions are derived from, and then hopefully get a deeper understanding of why acupuncture does what it does. Because I'm going to tell you, spleen nine is not fooling. Right, And I'm going to explain to you and prove to you that it's not fooling by going in depth and looking at what even the regular TCM books are telling us spleen nine does. Acupuncture and herbs are fundamentally different and they have different mechanisms of action. Acupuncture is all about regulating relationships in the channel system between the five phases, between yin and yang, within the sort of system of my body. And that's something different than consuming a substance that's going to have a specific function on the body. So let's talk about actions versus indications. And I will also say that obviously not everyone has this potential problem that we're just memorizing spleen nine, drain stamp, and forget the rest, or kidney two clears vacuity heat and forgets the rest. In my own acupuncture education, I spent as much time learning Japanese acupuncture as well as TCM acupuncture. And so I was never predisposed to believe that TCM acupuncture was the only way of doing things. And for me, that was a great gift that allowed me to explore things like Dong's acupuncture and other models that are, I don't think they're completely disentangled, but other models that challenge one way of looking at things. Right? So not everyone may have this problem, but I, I definitely have seen this as, a, as an issue with a lot of our acupuncture students. So let's talk a bit about what's the difference between a, an action or sometimes called a function in Chinese is called gong xiao and an indication uh, and this is a uh, true sure. So the difference between actions and indications is basically this. So an action describes a point through a TCM theoretical perspective, right? So what is it doing to an organ, to a channel system, to something of that sort? So for example, spleen nine, the actions are regulates the spleen, resolves dampness, et cetera. You can read the rest there. The indications on the other hand, describe the specific disease or symptom presentation that this point has been used to treat historically, traditionally, contemporarily, whatever. So under indications, we have things like abdominal distension or pain, no desire to eat, jaundice, sudden turmoil, diarrhea, knee pain, swelling, et cetera, right? And there's usually a, a long, long list of what these indications are, right? Now, interestingly enough, I've been practicing acupuncture long enough. I went to school in the pre-Deadman uh, text era. So I used CAM. Many of you probably also have studied from CAM, that's Chinese acupuncture and moxibustion. It's the it's the it's the the hardbound book with the dust jacket that has the picture of the bronze man on it. It was a, a nifty little book, I, I have to say. And if you have not paid attention or if you weren't aware, if you were to go back right now and pull CAM off your shelf for those of you who have it, you will notice that CAM has no actions in it. Each of the acupuncture points only has indications. 
When we open Deadman, we're going to see a, a section that has the actions. This is what Spl Spleen 9 does. And the indications, the list of disease presentations or symptom presentations, and they're separated out. Books like CAM only have indications. Why is that? That's because, uh, and I'll give you two quotes. One is from uh, Weissman and Fung. This is from the Practical Dictionary. And again, all the references to these, if you want to go back and find the sources, are uh, are in the in the reference list at the end of the at the end of the PowerPoint. So here, Weissman and Fung say traditionally acupuncture points were selected according to their ability to eliminate or alleviate particular disease patterns. And since World War II have been ascribed actions in a manner similar to medicinals, in other words, similar to herbs. So here, when we're looking at regulating the spleen and resolving dampness, this description of a point is based primarily on herbal medicine. Now, I'm not going to say that's necessarily a bad thing, and I'll explain that shortly. But it is a thing that we all need to be aware of when we're practicing acupuncture. So traditionally, spleen nine would have been chosen based on the indications. And we'll talk about how the actions were ascribed shortly. But mostly, books included indications, but there were no actions that were systematically applied to acupuncture points. It's not that they didn't exist at all. These didn't sort of pop up out of nowhere. It's someone just made it up in 1960. But they were derived from indications and other pieces of information we'll, we'll get to, right? Deadman and Akfaji say, in general, it can be said that the, uh, the ascribing of actions to acupuncture points is a modern, in other words, 20th century practice and one that draws from the Chinese herbal medicine tradition. Having said that, having said this, there is a clear evidence of this practice in early texts. So I'm not saying again that these happened willy-nilly, out of nowhere, that people just made the stuff up. That's not, that's not what I'm saying either. Most of the time, or many times, actions were ascribed specifically to point categories, as we'll go through shortly. So for example, Jingwell points were described as having certain basic actions or functions in the body as a general group. Same way with ink spring, shoe stream, et cetera, right? She cleft points. All of these sort of points were, were described as having certain types of functions or actions that were sort of across the board for that same point category. So that what I'm saying is that the functions or the actions are not necessarily a bad thing because I do think in education, they help summarize what a point can do in a very useful way. The problem becomes is if all we learn is the action, and then the only thing we remember is the main action drains damp, then we forget about all the other things that a point can potentially do. And we don't understand why points can have multiple indications. So we basically we stop doing critical analysis and the critical analysis will bring us from beginning level to hopefully a better mastery of the material does everyone understand that basic concept um, as we go through this by the way feel free to throw uh, questions in the chat box and we'll try to get to them as we can uh, we'll try to uh, leave time at some point to answer questions and for those for our our clin our uh, our or uh, our staff here who are doing the tech end of things, if really important questions come up as we're going through this, then then throw it up, right? Throw it out, out at me. Okay. So the, the problem then is that memorization of these basic functions becomes just a first step. And that's okay. We have to start with memorizing something. We have to start somewhere. And oftentimes memorization has to come before deeper understanding. The problem is when we memorize and stop without going into analysis, eventually at some point in our career, then we become sort of, we become rigid and we sort of stop at a certain point. The best example I can give you is that, you know, I was trained as, as an undergraduate, I was trained as a professional musician at Oberlin Conservatory. And I cannot tell you how many years and how many hours I spent playing scales, arpeggios, and preset patterns over and over and over again. You know, I probably 
studied music, instrumental music intensively for a decade before I learned anything about music theory. And that's how musicians are trained. We memorize things, we memorize core basic material, and we do it over and over and over again. And then we go to analysis, right? It's impossible for us to assume that beginners have the capacity to do as deep analysis as you can five years into practice, deeper 10 years into practice, deeper 20, 25 years into practice. I'll, be, I'll do analysis till the day I die, right? And that's the way, that's the way it's supposed to work. When we, so we start with memorization, it's not a bad thing, but eventually we need to really go deeper into the material. So as a musician, I needed to go in and understand the music theory behind the pieces I was playing in order to play them at a more virtuosic level, right? It, 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 virtuosity doesn't come at the beginning and it doesn't only come from memorization. It comes from eventually taking things apart, but you can't take things apart until you go back and learn basics first. That's why I wanted to go back to conventional acupuncture points because you all know them already. You don't have to worry about, oh, where is, uh, where is Lingu or where is uh, Wofu Hai or any of these other weird points with this weird numbering system. So when we go back to the basics, then you can go back and understand Dong's points even better because hopefully you'll understand that really core material. Okay. So, but why is it, it why does it eventually become important that we go back and not necessarily not necessarily only memorize these basic functions. Because for example, when we're looking at points like spleen nine, spleen nine, if we memorize drain stamp, we get a lot of what it does. But if we look at the indications, spleen nine also treats things like frequent urination or bedwetting and uresis. So how can we reconcile those two when those problems aren't from dampness? Right or kidney two, which we've memorized as clearing the acuity heat or clearing empty heat, also treats states of fearfulness. Or if you open up Deadman, it says specifically cold type diarrhea. Right, draining empty heat has nothing to do with treating cold type diarrhea. So we have to start understanding what is the broader uses of acupuncture points in order to really understand why all those things are in that list, and then we're set free because we're not memorizing one thing, we're understanding at a deeper level why these points are doing what they're doing, okay? When we're looking at point protocols, it's the same thing, right? So for example, here, uh, just on the slide you have, this is just something I, I pulled off my bookshelf. Again, when I was studying Japanese acupuncture, one of the books we used was uh, Monica's Chasing the Dragon's Tale. Uh, I think that's the title. It's also in the in the in the reference list. A really good book, and he gives us list after list of protocols for different conditions. So, for example, hemoptip, hemoptip, hem, sorry, <laughs> coughing up blood, right, or diarrhea. We have these points, and I remember one time asking one of my Japanese acupuncture teachers, why. You know, why these points? And they said, well, it's empirical. And nothing sets my hair on fire more than someone saying you do it because it's empirical, right? So I will give you my little rant right now on empirical and empiricism. I'm not saying that empirical doesn't exist. Clearly it does. Because people will sometimes figure out, uh, I, I don't know why it works, but it works. I can live with that. But when someone tells you it's empirical, when they have like a list of this, it means one of three things. One, they don't know why. Two, they don't think you're smart enough to understand why. Or three, they just don't want to bother telling you. There are plenty of things that I don't know why it exactly works, but I know it's because I don't know why it works. So it may be empirical, but if I spend more time, maybe I won't do it in my lifetime, but if we spend enough time on it, we can understand why it works. So when we're looking at these protocols, you cannot tell me that for like diarrhea, a famous acupuncturist went through all 300 plus points on the body and figured out because they tried every single one of them, which was the point that worked best just by sheer luck. That's what empirical really means. They had to have an idea in their head why they chose this point or a certain number of points and then narrowed it down by 
out of a small number of points which one tended to work better. But there had to be some sort of theoretical understanding behind it for them to choose a specific set of points. It wasn't just, I'm trying 300 plus points on 10,000 people with diarrhea, and I happen to figure out that these were the three best. It's a ridiculous assumption. So we need to move beyond the idea of empiricism. If you don't know why something works, that's fine. There are plenty of things I teach. I don't know exactly 100% why it works. That's fine. And I will tell you, I don't know exactly why it works. But if we believe that there is such a thing as yin yang, five phase theory, channel systems, organ, if we believe that that is actually there, and it's not just some fanciful, ancient, quaint idea, if we believe that's a real way of understanding the body, there's, an, there's a way of understanding everything that points to. If you don't believe in yin yang, five phases, channel systems, et cetera, this is the wrong class for you, right? Do a class on trigger point needling. And that's fine too. If that's how you like to do it, I don't have any problem with it. But what we're going to do is going go back and try to understand through different ways of models of analysis why points are doing what they're doing. And we're going to combine ideas from the, I'll, we'll say TCM, but what I really mean is the traditional Chinese medical canon, as well as the ideas that we talk about through Dong's acupuncture, because I'm going to tell you those ideas also do not violate basic principles of yin yang in five phases. If they did violate those principles, they would not be valid. So the reason why all the things that we usually throw under the heading of Dong's acupuncture work is because precisely they still have to do with a deep understanding of yin yang in five phases, channel systems, organ systems, et cetera, that are not incongruous with that which we see within the traditional Chinese medical uh, canons. Does that make sense to everyone? So what we're going to start with then is models of analysis, or as I like to subt subtitle, yin and yang or the Tao. And we'll see those quotes. And then use that as a way to understand conventional acupuncture points. So what we're going to do today is do the basic theory. Then we're going to go and try to understand point by point by point, what are some of the broader pictures that we can see and start understanding them in a different way when, when we open up the book and it says, you know, the, the big aha, one of the big aha moments for me is when I first got Deadman back in like 1999 when it was published. After I was out of acupuncture school, I remember looking up lung five and we're gonna see lung five today. And lung five treats knee pain and back pain. And I used to think to myself, how the hell does lung five treat knee pain and back pain? And today I think, how does it not treat right knee pain and back? And knee pain and back pain for lung five is a TCM thing. It's not Dong's acupuncture. And it is Dong's acupuncture. Why? Because Dong's acupuncture does not violate basic principles of Chinese medicine. If it did, it would be invalid as an acupuncture system. Anyone who tells you that Dong's acupuncture has nothing to do with anything else doesn't understand Dong's acupuncture and doesn't understand TCM acupuncture right? They may have different preferences in terms of strategy of diagnosis and treatment, a different algorithm. So Saam acupuncture, Japanese meridian therapy acupuncture, TCM acupuncture, Dong's acupuncture, they all have maybe slightly different strategies of how can we go about and treat something, but none of them violate core principle. And that's the important piece of it. Okay. So let's start talking about some core principle that I'm going to be using to analyze points. There can be different core principles out there that we don't have time to explore in just one day. But these are ones that I found useful, and I'm hoping that you will find this model useful when we're looking at points as well. Tomorrow, what we're going to be doing, or for those of you in the future listening to this, part two of the class, we're going to take these same concepts and understand now, not single points, but how can we start making point pairs, not protocols, because we can't go back to understand protocols, in my opinion, until we understand even two-point combinations. Two-point combinations are the miniature version of protocols that eventually we need to sort of really drill down on before we can go back and look at a protocol of five, six, whatever, 10 points and understand in that protocol, which ones should I use? Which ones should I take out? Which ones should I add? Right, so part two will be point pairings through looking at the same sort of lens of theory, okay? So let's start looking at models of analysis. 
So the reason why I subtitle it yin and yang or the Tao is because they are, right? So this is uh, a quote from the Shitsa, which is a, a Confucian commentary basically on the I Ching. This is one yin and one yang, this is the Tao. This comes from Ling Shu 42. Being illuminated to yin and yang is like having all confusion resolved and like waking up after being drunk. Yeah, it's, that's good. That's definitely good stuff. This is from Suen chapter five. So they've been telling us, right? They've been telling us for 2000 years. Hey, listen, you want to understand all this? This is what you understand. Yin and yang are the Tao of heaven and earth, the essential principle of the 10,000 things, the father and mother of change and transformation, the basis and start of birth and death in the palace of the of the Shenming, of the spirit brilliance, right? There's another, uh, there's another quote that, um, that I usually give, I didn't put it in this lecture, but there it's in other lectures I've done here from e Lotus, And this is by uh, Zheng Qinan. He was the founder of the Huo Shenpai, the Fire Sage School. And I'll paraphrase it because I don't remember the exact quote off the top of my head. Basically says, you know, when you're uh, when you're choosing herbs, choosing herbs is is you know not the choosing or choosing specific herbs is not the tough part. You know, understanding the pattern is 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 the is the hard part. Right? With the assumption that you understand the pattern, choosing herbs is easy. Right. And everyone says, all right, of course. Yeah, that, that I get. Sure. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. But then he goes on to the next sentence and says, you know what? The pattern, that's not the tough part. Yin and yang, that's really the tough part. Because it goes back to that fundamental understanding. That's what we really have to wrap our head around. And then everything else flows from that. So this becomes what we're basically looking at. Now, acupuncture points, when we're looking at them and looking at what they do, all points have both local and distant indications. This is especially so for the points on the on the extremities, the head, the arms, the legs, which is why, for example, Dong's acupuncture focuses on these areas and it's really bloodletting on the rest of the trunk. So the local indications most of us can understand fairly easily. If some sort of dysfunction, pain, disease of the body is a dysregulation in the movement of qi and blood, then putting a needle where the dysregulation is can have some effect, right? Local indications we don't have to worry about because they're relatively easy to understand. Now, the distant indications are the ones, how do we wrap our heads around that? And the distant indications are oftentimes the ones that really give us the aha moments in seeing the broader principles if we're willing to look for them. Now, notice I will say distant rather than distal. I, I'm really trying to, train all of us to stop saying distal point acupuncture because distal is a specific anatomic direction, which means it only goes away from the trunk, right? So distal would be basically using the hand to treat something higher up, but we know we can switch it. So like when the elbow treats the knee, elbow is not distant to the knee, El oh, sorry, elbow is not distal to the knee because they're not on the same limb. Elbow is distant from the knee. So basically, we can put a point somewhere in the body and have it affect somewhere else on the body. Those indications are the ones that are really going to give us deeper insight into what are what is really the dynamic of the point trying to do. Okay. Notice also, local and distant in and of itself is a yin and yang binary, where local we can, con we can conceive of as yin, distal is yang, because Distant, distal is yang, and close by is yin. So even the pairing, the breaking down of, of indications between distant and local in and of itself is an yin and yang binary, right? That's an important thing we need to uh, understand. So we're gonna, we're gonna break down the distant indications by the channels, by the connections between the channels, connections between areas of the body, five phase dynamics, et cetera. So, one of the things we have to also remember is that the channels are important loci of diagnosis and treatment. When we're doing acupuncture, the needle is primarily affecting a channel, right? So we can affect the interior of the body. We can, we can affect the zhang and fu, but that's through the medium of the channel. Does that make sense? 
So when we're doing this, we have to really understand the basic idea of channel diagnosis as well as zhang fu diagnosis, because the way we get to the zhang fu are through the channels. So even we have this idea. For example, this is a, a quote from the second volume of the the Great Compendium of Acupuncture. It says, "Ning shi qi shui, wu shi qi jing." So it's better to lose the point than miss the channel, right? So it's high. It's, it's like knocking us over the head with a hammer. It says you've got to pay attention to the channels, which means we have to understand the channel itself, the channel relationships, etc. Right. So this is going to be something we're going to be looking at also when we're focusing on it. Okay. So this is just a reminder and a summary. We don't. We're not going to go into into a long time, but. Your job is to go back and try to really take a look at and keep on reminding yourself or what are the functions of the organs? What are this, the functions? So it's if we know the functions of the organs and we know how they can exist in a state of disease. We know normative function. We can understand disease function. We know where the channels go. We know what the normative functions of the channels are. Then we can understand the disease presentations. So this is just an example of a summary that you can take a look at, go back and read it on your own. And I gave you the sources uh, because I like to go back to, I mean, modern textbooks are great, but I think going back and reading it in the original context is, is very useful. So we have quotes here from the Suwen, from the Nanjing, et cetera. Okay. This again, you just go back and read by yourself. So first thing I wanna take a look at is the five shoe points. And when I say the five shoe points, I mean the Jing Ing Shu Jing He points, the Jing Well Ing Spring Shu Stream, Jing River, and He Uniting points. And trying to take a look at them as a model for understanding acupuncture points, primarily because they're going to be some of the more dynamic points. So when we are looking at specific points, remember the points on the extremities will tend to have more varied, distant indications compared to the points on the trunk. Points in the trunk definitely have distant indications as well, but they're not going to be as varied as the ones on the distal extremities. Okay. So we're going to start by taking a look at what are some of the five shoe points? What do they do? How can we conceive of them? Also because, as I said earlier, the actions of acupuncture points did not spring up out of nowhere. And one of the core sources we see for the actions is that different point categories especially like the five shoe points, were traditionally ascribed certain actions as a group. And even understanding those actions, we can look at five phase and yin-yang dynamics. Okay. So some basic principle here is that each of the shoe points have specific indications. The indications help us derive the actions and sometimes they're described as actions. And it's also important to, for us to understand that every channel, each of the channels has a connection to all five phases, especially through the shoe points. And that is also based on yin and yang. So we can understand the indications and treat the channels by understanding the five phases in the body, their interrelationships, and then that interrelationship between channels and the channel, one channel to another, or one channel to another organ, mediated through five phase relationships that are expressed through the Jing Shu Jing points. Okay. So let's take a look at uh, some of the some of the specific indications and derive an understanding of, of how this works. These indications, by the way, are derived primarily from Nanjing chapter sixty eight. So if you want to go back and take a look at the original source of this, these specific ones here that we're going to start with, and then we'll summarize because there's more than one specific chapter, but we don't have time to go through all the chapters ever written on the on the five shoe points. Nanjing 68, though, is a really essential uh, place where we can start. So the first thing we have here is the Jing well points control fullness below the heart. Okay. So the Jing well points are... They reflect wood. And if you go back and read the commentary to Nanjing 68, and uh, Professor Unschuld has a wonderful translation of, of Nanjing uh, with commentary translated, which so it's important you read the commentary as well. 
So non-gene non -gene 68 gives us this line, and then the commentary says the Jing well points go with wood. Now, clearly the yin and the yang channels don't have the same association. For example, on the yang channels, the Jing well points are metal, but I'm going to tell you that based on my reading of the non-Jing, all Jing well points have a fundamental nature of wood, right? And we'll talk about that at some point shortly. And I believe the non-Jing is telling us this. The yang channels are have multiple personalities, though, because we're all complex, right? We're not, none of us as, as people are one thing. Acupuncture points are not one thing. And that's an important thing to remember. And so for the time being, we're going to assume and view all the Jingwell points as having some inherent wood nature that we can use to understand why they're doing what they're doing. Um, and we can have a deeper conversation of that over dim sum in New York City if anyone wants to come visit. So here it says the Jingwell points control fullness below the heart. So the commentary basically says the wells are reflective of wood. Obviously on the yin channels they are. Because of that, they correspond to liver or have a liver nature. The location of liver is like right below the diaphragm. And when they say control fullness below the heart, that, that's this area of the epigastrium and the diaphragm. That's what they're talking about. They're not talking about it in the chest. So it's this area. So here, what the commentary says is that the, the disease state has to do with liver and the liver tends to overact, right? It tends to have a control cycle, right? Or restraining cycle relationship with spleen. So we have to remember that five phase relationship. And because that there is a disease in the liver and the spleen presentation. So both of those exist below the diaphragm. It has a disease in that location. And spleen, if we look at chapter 74, this comes from the 19 lines in pathology. It says all damp and swelling, all damp swelling and fullness are subordinate to the So swelling and fullness has to do with spleen. That's a pathology of earth or soil phase. Okay. So also think of it this way. Swelling accumulation is yin. Right? When something becomes swollen, we have accumulation that's a yin state. Out of the five Jing Ying Chu Jing Ho points, the Jing Well points are the most yang. Why? They're the most distal. Just look at your body. Just it's look at the anatomy. This moves a lot faster than my elbow does and has a lot more different weird movements I can do with this than I can with my elbows. So if we're comparing fingers to elbows, distal is yang, proximal is yin, which is why in terms of the five shoe points, we have wood, fire, right? So jing, ing is wood and fire, they're distal. Metal and water are more proximal. Why? Because metal and water are yin. And then soil, earth, I'm gonna to try to get us all to stop saying earth, mainly because there's two words in Chinese for earth. There's tu, which basically means dirt. That's the five phases. And there's di, as in like tian di, like heaven and earth. So it, I, I didn't change it for this PowerPoint because I don't wanna make heads explode, but eventually we should stop saying earth element. Earth element is like the worst. It should be soil phase. That's my personal crusade someday. But the, in the middle is the earth or the soil because that's the transition between yang and yin. Get it? So if this is something that's yin accumulation, then we need to break it up by using the most yang points available. That's the jing well points. Get it? That's jing well. The ing spring points are fire, and it says in the Nanjing, the ing spring points control body heat. This one is fairly, this one is fairly straightforward. Right there, the spring points are the, the phase of fire, they reflect heart. The commentary in Nanjing 68 says the lung is the surface of the body, right? Represents the skin and the hair. And in this case, we have so it's control cycle or restraining cycle relationships. So here we have heart, fire, affecting skin, hair, surface, metal, because fire restrains or fire controls metal. So we have body heat that manifests on the surface. People have red face. So you can see it. It's not, yes, we can have heat on the inside, but you also can see it manifest on the outside. And so what we need to do is we can treat it by, for example, here, draining the fire points. I think that one's pretty straightforward. The shoe stream points control heaviness and pain, uh, sorry, heaviness of the body and joint pain. 
So heaviness corresponds to spleen, right? That has to do with here, damp swelling and fullness. So that sense of heaviness has to do with spleen by itself or things like dampness, which associate with spleen. The soil earth phase has a restraining or control cycle relationship on the kidney. Kidney rules, rules the bones. This is in the comment. This is not me saying this is the commentary uh, in the Nanjing. And so because of this, the kidneys ruling the bone, they deal with ruling the bony junctions, which are the joints, right? So heaviness of the body and joint pain have to do with the spleen earth by itself, as well as kidney water and bones. So we can have both heaviness of the body and problems in that bony junction, right? So she stream points, lots of pain indications we'll see. And interestingly, for those of you who do know Dong's acupuncture or are going to eventually look into Dong's acupuncture, the point category out of the Jingying Shu Jing He that's most represented in Dong's points is the shoe stream points, right? Because we use it a lot for pain management. And not only does uh, Dong's acupuncture have most, the only one it doesn't have it, that doesn't have it all in Dong's acupuncture are the three yin of lung nine, pericardium seven, and heart seven. And it doesn't have bladder 65, but it does have the 13th shoe stream point, which is in one of my other lectures. So you have to go back through the other lectures to listen to the 13th shoe stream point or come visit me in New York for dim sum. All right, so that's the shoestring point. The Jing River is the next one. The Jing Rivers are metal points. And it says in the Nanjing, the Jing River controls panting and coughing and alternating cold and heat. All right, so panting and coughing, that's pretty straightforward. That has, that's if the metal phase, the lung itself is ill. If it's affected by cold, we can have coughing result. If it's affected by heat, then we have panting. So panting is like rapid breathing. So we can have cold or hot. That's important to notice. One of the things I will tell you is that acupuncture is not herbs because acupuncture more often than herbs has a homeostatic regulating effect. So even here, when it says the Jing River controls panting and coughing, and the commentary says one is from hot, one is from cold, we know that we can use acupuncture almost bi-directionally. Herbs, maybe not so much. So I don't know an herb, for example, that both clears liver fire, but at the same time nourishes liver blood or clears liver fire and warms liver yang at the same time. But acupuncture points can do this depending on the context of the patient, the combination, needle technique, et cetera. Right, so it's not, they're not the same thing. And even this little statement tells us that. So here it says that this is related to the, uh, to the metal. Metal is in a control cycle or restraining cycle relationship with wood. So wood can give us these sort of alternating cold and heat. That's more of like a Xiaoyang presentation, et cetera. Right, so we can see both the phase itself and the relationship between other phases. The he uniting points, uh, and I'm going to try to encourage us to stop saying he si, because the word in Chinese is not si as an ocean. It's the he means to come together, which is the image of an ocean, which is why they call them the he si points. But the coming together is more important than the, if you understand the image of an ocean or a sea as something coming together, you're okay. If you don't understand that's what this comes from, then we maybe miss some of the function. So it says here that the he uniting controls counterflow qi and diarrhea. So the, and the commentary says the he uniting or water correspond to kidney. If it's a problem, then the, uh, the chong mai, which is by the time they're writing this in the Nanjing commentary, you can go read the commentary, has association with the kidney. Chong mai is associated with counterflow of qi, so that qi can move in counterflow. The kidney also is in charge of the movement of storage, right? So keep that in the back of your head. The kidney is in charge of the movement of storage, right? So in the Nanjing, sorry, in the Neijing, we have this cast, this uh, this description, which we will come to, that talks about birth, growth, harvest, and storage, right? So kidney is about holding things in. So if you can't hold things in, then you have counterflow stuff moves in the opposite direction it should, and you have diarrhea. Now, diarrhea is just an image of something moving in a way it's not supposed to be moving. We're supposed to hold, and in this case, we can't hold it. 
And even though we oftentimes associate diarrhea with spleen stomach, we can also associate it with kidney, right? So here, this is a, a quote from Sue in chapter four. It says, in the north, the black color, it enters and communicates with the kidney and opens in the two yin orifices, which is the urethra and the anus, right? So when we can't, and the kidney can't hold, then we can have leaking down of urine, stool, et cetera. Okay. So those are some of the, from Nanjing 68. Now, we don't, like I said, we don't necessarily have time to go through every classical chapter that talks about the, the function. So we're just going to go and summarize. And this comes from, you can read this summary in, uh, in, in Peter Dedman and in Mazin al kafaji's book, The, the uh, Manual of Acupuncture. Okay, they have really nice summaries in the introduction sections. Um, the Jingwell points treat things like fullness below the heart that we saw. They clear heat. Why? Because of the most yang points. They restore consciousness. We'll talk about why they restore consciousness later. It's not just something that's empirical, right? We're going to understand it. Disorders of the Shen, we'll talk about, et cetera, you know, before or later, et cetera. Ink spring points, heat in the body, changes in the complexion. So changes in the complexion can mean red face, can mean pallor. Why? Because it's bi-directional, right? It's not only clear as heat. Clear heat is one of the things, but not the only thing. Okay. The shoestring points treat heaviness and pain in the body, uh, pain in the joints. And the word for of those of you who can read Chinese, you'll see this, the character, the first character there is shu, the second character is shu. The first character shu is in shu stream, and it's a homophone with shu as in, as in like the ling shu, the miraculous pivot, right? So things that pivot are the joints in the body open and close, right? So even the, the in, sometimes in Chinese, sounds like means like. The Jing River treat cough, shortness of breath, right, because they're metal. Changes in the voice, and we'll see changes in the voice. There is some deeper meaning to changes in the voice we'll get to. And the uniting treat counterfeit chi, diarrhea, problems of the stomach, and we'll see why problems of the stomach, it's not just random. And diseases from irregular eating or drinking. And again, for more of these details, we you have the source. 